It's the 1990s, and as a kid back then, one computer company loomed large when it came to super powerful systems. You had heard of them, but these systems were hugely expensive and beyond the reach of normal people. They were used to develop some of the most graphically impressive games of the time and the films you watched. That company was SGI, and this is one of their workstations, the Octane 2. We're going to have a bit of a play with this machine and have a look at some of the history surrounding it. SGI started life as a manufacturer of raster terminals, which is essentially the bitmap equivalent of a green screen dumb terminal, only you could put pixels on the screen rather than just text. It made use of the geometry pipeline Gene Clark and Mark Hanna created at Stanford. This raster terminal also made use of a Motorola 68000 as the CPU, which meant that SGI realized that they could turn their terminal into a standalone computer, which eventually they did. This standalone machine would run System 5 Unix and was the basis for SGI's initial reputation as a graphics workstation company. The 68000 soon became the limiting factor for SGI's workstation capabilities, and given RISC was the next big thing, SGI found a new RISC CPU from MIPS to base their new machines around. The Iris 4D was the first SGI machine to make use of the MIPS CPU, and would also see SGI rename its version of System 5 Unix to IRIX. This marks the beginning of SGI's most successful period. SGI started making sales to all sorts of market sectors, from mathematical modeling, which is where I first used an SGI machine, like BNFL's mass modeling department, scientific visualization, airport security scanners, 3D CAD CAM, and most famously of all, film production. SGI soon found its niche in the burgeoning world of CG, fast becoming the workstation of choice for animators. Most of the well-known CG-heavy films of the time were done on SGI machines, for example, The Abyss and Terminator 2. SGI machines soon became so familiar with filmmakers, they started to appear in films, like this SGI Crimson, here in Jurassic Park. It's a Unix system, I know this. And also a 1995 film Disclosure, a film about sexual harassment and CD-ROM drive manufacturing, where the least realistic part, and I'm including a young Demi Moore coming onto an aging Michael Douglas, was that every member of staff had an SGI workstation. Were we supposed to believe their IT department had an out-of-control spending problem and nobody looked at their budget? They also only seemed to use them to open emails in the most excessively animated email client ever. Also, for no reason, they built a VR interface to their database. I mean, that feels like a useful UI experience. SGI machines were also used in the growing world of 3D animation, with Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Ants, all being created on SGI hardware. SGI Kit soon took over the editing process, in the same way that virtually all film and video is edited on computers today. Flame by Discrete Logic was first used on SGI machines to edit 1993's Super Mario Bros. The Movie, a film whose star Bob Hoskins described as the low point in his career, and a film that he wished he'd not said yes to. Luckily for SGI, it proved that their systems were great for editing films, even if that film is awful. The Octane we're going to look at was primarily used for editing, so we're going to get to see Flame up and running on that. With SGI starting to see itself as a machine for creatives, SGI started including derpy little things with its machines. For example, when it produced the low-cost version of the Indigo, the Indie, well, low-cost for SGI, it came with a set of juggling balls. For the Octane, things got even more derpy, and here they produced the music CD to come with it. I'll, I'll, I'll play you a sample. Yep, SGI did this. Drink it in. Okay, they did make this around the time that Harry Connick Jr. had had some success musically, so social attitudes towards his music were different back then. Do you know, I've recently been listening to and enjoying the music of Harry Connick Jr. Well, it's not ready ahead, but it's okay. Whereas, of course, now we know the correct response is a little different. I've recently been listening to and enjoying the music of Harry Connick Jr. I want to divorce. <laughs> SGI had quite the range of systems, from desktop workstations to massive side of desk machines. They also had huge rack mount based servers, or multi rack based systems. SGI even tried with low cost machines. Firstly, there was the Indie, which is a low cost version of the Indigo 2. That was not a great success for SGI, as it had some very significant performance issues. Initially, it only shipped with 16 meg of RAM and a version of IRIX that had memory management problems, which admittedly later they fixed. 
These performance problems led to the indie being known as the Indigo Without the Go. It did come up with some interesting features though to be added to a machine for the first time. So it concluded the webcam, the indie cam, which meant you could do video conferencing in 1993. I think most of us tried in 2020 for the first time. SGI then tried to build a low cost machine again. This one was far more successful and is a low cost version of the Octane known as the O2. I think a big part of the cost saving was probably that they just shrunk the thing down by the looks of it. I mean, look how tiny it looks next to this Octane. The public awareness of SGI and its graphics capabilities was riding pretty high, and SGI based machines had started being used by games developers to pre render 3D graphics, which games could include later as sprites, for example, Rare's Donkey Kong on the SNES. This attracted the attention of Nintendo, who were looking to SGI to help them create a more powerful graphics chipset for their next console, codenamed Project Reality. This could be the subject of a whole other video, so I'll just give it a quick mention here. But Project Reality spawned the N64. The initial developer kits for the N64 were SGI Onyx machines, which were not only hugely powerful, they were also physically huge to boot. Later on, when N64 hardware could be shipped to games developers, they could get away with using an SGI Indie to do the actual coding on, as they no longer had to emulate the entire of the N64. Everything was going about as well as it could do for SGI. It had purchased its CPU provider MIPS to secure the future of their CPU. They had just bought the world famous supercomputer company Cray after SGI had entered the supercomputing space. And it's around this time that SGI launches the Octane, the workstation we're gonna have a look at. Now this one is an Octane 2, which is a later version with some improvements like a more powerful CPU. I'd used an Octane a few times as part of my work, but never had one personally. And frankly, when it was new in the mid 90s, it cost more than the house I was living in. So there was very little prospect of me owning one. Now I nearly did not take this one downstairs to film it and make it look all nice like it does now, as it's ridiculously heavy. I mean, it's utter an involuntary swear word as you pick it up heavy. Here's the page in the manual showing how to move it. There's a reason it shows two people. According to the manual, it weighs 25 kilograms, which is Roughly 55 pounds for our American cousins. It's it's a heavy computer. I think this must be because it's about 90% CPU heatsink. As you can see, it's got a modular construction, so it can be easily serviced by field engineers. This started off with the server and desk side models and soon became standard for the desktops with the Octane and O2. In fact, I'll show you an O2 being taken apart. Does its connectors are a bit less delicate than that of the Octane? In fact, some of the connectors on the Octane are so delicate that if you touch them, that's it, you, you kill them. This Octane has the most powerful graphics card it can take, and the only one more powerful than it uses two slots. And on this machine, we've had to use the second slot for the video I.O. board, so we're able to get video in and out of this machine. The Octane also has a cage of PCI-X cards, which while much slower than SGI's own XIO bus, it's a lot cheaper as you can make use of PCI-X cards that were aimed at high-end Intel-based systems at the time. This also greatly increased the range of add-on cards which it could use. In ours, we got a fiber channel card, which we need for Flame, a SCSI card, and a 1GB Ethernet card. The Ethernet card's there to solve a problem for me, because although there's an onboard 100 meg card, it has a very picky transceiver on it. The Octane Zoom built Ethernet adapter was really early onto the 100 meg standard, and therefore it's not really happy with an awful lot of switches. Um, so this is why I bought a second Ethernet card so I could get that in, which would be a lot less picky with switches, so I could plug it into, you know, the kit I've got. Right, let's switch to some captured footage, as I bet you're dying to see what this thing can do. Firstly, let's have a little look at the UI. SGI has its own unique GUI, while most of the other Unix vendors standardized around the common desktop environment, or CDE, and its motif widget set. SGI instead decided to stick with their own UI, possibly because it looked good and, you know, was nice to use. Whereas the others like Sun used open windows, which, which never looked great. One of the nice surprises for a lot of people would be that it was bundled with a copy of Doom, so there was their equivalent of Minesweeper. Here it is running as smooth as butter in a window where even as the most powerful PCs at the time the Octane was released, which would have been the 486DX266, we'll get nowhere near this frame rate in full screen. And it's not like Doom was coded to take advantage of the 3D hardware. This is all CPU based. This also helps us neatly tick that obligatory box for all YouTube videos about old computers in that we must show it running Doom. If we want to look at SGI's hardware acceleration, well, we're going to have to play some of the demos. This menu will probably be a bit familiar to Nintendo fans. This demo nicely shows off the texture handling. 
There are also some versions of software that most people probably didn't know had an SGI port. Here's Photoshop, for example. We also have a number of 3D rendering packages available, which helped to make the SGI famous in the first place. We also have some 3D games that SGI produced as quick demos for their hardware, and these would have been considered quite impressive at the time. Also of a sign of the times and the power of the whole Wintel platform, even SGI needed a way to run Windows applications. So they included this emulation layer, which allowed you to run Windows 95. And honestly, for hardware that was contemporary for the time of Windows 95, this is an impressively snappy experience. My PC at the time never ran 95 this well. Look, we can even run Doom for Windows in it, and it runs well. And of course, having shown Doom running twice on this thing, that makes this video doubly retro. Now, let's see this machine running as a video editor, as that's what this particular Octane was used for. First of all, we have to start the fiber channel storage array. This incredibly noisy box of SCSI disks is essential for making flame work. As you can probably imagine, raw video footage takes an incredible amount of storage, particularly for the time, so video was stored on these large fiber channel arrays. Now, I've just got one of these units, but you can chain a number of them together. This one holds 22 72 gig SCSI drives, at 11 at the front and 11 at the rear, given a whole 1.5 terabytes of storage. Admittedly, this is not a huge amount of storage for video, but larger outfits would have used more than one of these units. The way the disks are used by Flame is a bit odd. There's not a regular POSIX filing system sitting on these disks with files and directories, etc., as this would have generated far too much work at the time. Instead, the application accesses the disks directly using a software layer called StoneFS to manage the disks. This way, the video blocks are stored in the most efficient way for the editor to access them, meaning we can have smooth video editing in 1995 at resolutions that are thoroughly modern. Now, this is going to get a bit inceptioning. I'm going to film this bit on a mini DV camera and edit it in flame so you can see what the process will be like. So, here's me recording a little bit of footage on the camera of the machine and the storage array. I'll then take the tape out and pop this in the DV cam tape unit. I can now transfer the footage from the tape to the SGI machine. This uses the SDI input on the SGI's video I.O. board. SDI is a digital video signal standard that's still in use in TV and film production. This takes a while as the footage can only be transferred at real time, so three hours of footage takes three hours. You can now see it's captured, as is the footage of it being captured. Ooh, inceptioning. And I can now do a bit of screen capture so you can see me editing it together, which I then edit into the video. Ooh, even more inceptioning. Okay, we'll knock it off with the SGI editing, or this video will just recurse forever. These systems became remarkably popular for news production and TV commercials, which was still pretty big budget then. Here's a clip from Discrete Logic's promotional video for Flame, showing off some of the stuff created on it. You recognize a few ads in there if you're as old as me and, well, British. You're probably wondering what this system cost. Well, I managed to find pricing for an Octane system with the Flame license, storage array, etc., and it came to $399,198, which in today's money is $677,931, or £495,000. If you just wanted the Octane without the video I.O. board and frame licenses and fiber channel, etc., that would have come to a much more reasonable $30,000, which is just above $50,000 today, or £37,000. So, you know, at that bargain price, let's get two. Now, if SGI was successfully selling workstations for 30 grand, you're probably wondering what happened? How come they're not around anymore? Well, a few things happened. Firstly, the PC started to get 3D cards. In fact, NVIDIA, one of the leading card vendors, was actually started by a former SGI engineer. These 3D cards initially could not touch what SGI kit could do, but the gap was closing fast. PCs were also getting more and more powerful CPUs at the same time. Linux was also a significant factor. Most of the software that ran on Iris could be ported to Linux without too much trouble. Linux also let you build cheap clusters of machines so you could rival SGI's most powerful kit. SGI also made mistakes. Its new CEO decided it wanted to embrace Intel, and it embraced what would soon become one of Intel's largest disasters, the Itanium. This hurt SGI in two ways. First, the Itanium went very, very wrong. It was supposed to have incredible performance and yet perform like a pig, as its performance gains could only be realized if compilers could group instructions together in a way that the CPU expected. And compilers never did manage to do that. 
The very noticeable shift to Itanium also really hurt confidence in the MIPS based line of machines, as people thought they might end up with a dead end system. And while STI did swap focus back to MIPS, the damage was done, and in lots of places it jumped ship to the PC or clusters of PCs running Linux. SDI had also carried out some unwise purchases, for example Cray, from whom they kept the Craylink technology they used in their origin systems, but sold the rest at a loss. They also were forced to sell their CPU division, MIPS. For a while SDI tried to be a provider of supercomputing systems, even moving to Intel's Xeon CPUs, but other PC vendors running Linux soon overtook them in the supercomputer market. SGI entered Chapter 11 in 2006, which it did sort of recover from, to finally go bankrupt in 2008, being purchased by Rackable Systems, who renamed themselves to Silicon Graphics International, or SGI for short, who then went defunct in 2016 when they were purchased by HP. SGI may be gone, but its legacy is still with us, not just in terms of the films, games and TV shows they helped us make, but as the technology as well. Irix's file system XFS was ported to Linux, and is now the default file system for Red Hat Enterprise. SGI also created the 3D graphics API OpenGL and its descendant Vulkan. They're still in use in games consoles, PCs and mobiles, and tablets too. Given its size, SGI managed to have an outsized impact on the world of film technology and media. That about wraps it up for this video. My thanks to all of you for watching, and of course Nikki and Bunty for lending their voice talents. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by commenting in the section below or pressing the like button, as I have more SGI hardware here I could cover, and if there's an interest, I'll certainly do more. If you really like this video, feel free to share it with others, and if you really, really liked it, why not subscribe? Subscriptions make a huge difference to small channels like this one.